From Koningstein Road in the east to Casitas Gap in the west, an orange curtain has descended across the Ojai Valley. This is Ojai Talk of the Town. Hey everyone, Brett Bradigan, editor of your Ojai Magazines and Monthly and Quarterly. Our guest, Fiona Ma, is the California State Treasurer, Chief Banker for our $3.8 trillion economy, which, if California were a sovereign nation, would be the fifth or sixth largest, no, fourth or fifth largest economy in the world, neck and neck with Germany, depends on the day. She oversees a $300 billion budget, and right now, the urgent demands on her skills are that we're facing a $38 billion deficit. Uh, the reason we got her on the podcast, which is, as you know, the Ojai podcast, is because she is married to Jason Hodge, who is a Ventura County firefighter. At one time, he was stationed at Station 20 in Upper Ojai, so um, she's got some great local connections. Anyway, hope you enjoy. Cover a lot of ground. Fascinating discussion. Hi, Fiona. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brett. So, uh, first off, I you know, was reading a very fun story about how you and your husband met. Your husband's a local boy, Ventura County firefighter. So, um, I noticed uh, in the description, he was kind of followed you around this meeting to try to make an impression. And then the second day, you went out dancing. And the third encounter, he called you up for dinner. And I just thought, you know, respect. That's good game. Guy's got some tight game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, pretty surprising. So I guess one of our friends bet that he couldn't really meet me or ask me out. And so that oh, started his, so it was like a dare. his ego. It was a challenge. Yes, okay, it yes. started as a challenge. And, and uh, you know, 13 years later. And he, he won that dollar bet. He did. He did. <laughs> So, um, what what do you uh, th- you know? What is your impressions of Ojai, Ventura County? I mean, you've been a fixture in this entire state for a while. How, when you hear Ojai, what associations does that bring up for you? Uh, that brings up a nice, tight knit community. Maybe a little earthy, crunchy. A little bit woo. Yes, um, obviously, there's horse owners up here. Um, beautiful town. I've been up here a number of times, and my husband was a firefighter uh, here in Ojai, so um, I've been in and around for the last 10 years. Nice. So you feel like you've got some uh, familiarity with us. And, and you got great private schools. Oh, yes, we do. In fact, yeah. uh, during the pandemic, I noticed a lot of new families moving in to take advantage of that. That is definitely a feather in our cap. A friend of mine described Ojai in its economy is three stools. There's the farming, there's the um, tourism, and then there's the private schools. I thought that was an uh, apt description. All good. Yeah. So um, back to Sacramento. Well, first, let's talk a little bit about your past. You actually were born in New York, and then you moved to California when you were fairly young. Yes, that's right. So um, my parents were both born in China. They immigrated to Hong Kong. They met in Canada. And then we settled in New York. My maternal grandfather was a minister, and my mom was an only child, so that's how... Yeah, it gets shifted around from congregation to congregation. Kind of. That's how it works. So my grandfather was a minister in New York City, uh, where I was born and raised. Uh, My parents worked in Yonkers, where um, they worked during the week. I stayed with my grandparents, and then they saved up enough money to buy a house in Long Island because of Mm. the great school, public school system. And then after college, my brother and I were in college, and my parents said, we're moving to San Francisco again to follow my grandfather. Yeah. Well, you went to Rochester, right? I did. Now, I'm from Chautauqua County, which is just uh, west of Buffalo. But Rochester's part of our kind of catchment basin, especially for Buffalo Bills fans. Yes, yes. Very cold, though. (laughs) It is, especially now. Yeah, so California must seem like a a paradise compared to those winters. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really realize how beautiful and, you know, like paradise that California is. My dad would always say, you know, 
we want to move to California because it's going to be the best place to live. And yeah, the land of milk and honey. Born in you know New York, and I wanted to live and work in Manhattan, so yeah. I wasn't really for that idea. But I moved out here, interviewed, got a job, and I'm very very happy that I am in California yeah. now. Well, it's worked out for us. So the only um, uh, you know one one fact about you that I find. Um, a little shocking is you're in whatever 183 years of California history, you're only the second CPA to serve as treasurer. Yes. I should say that's shocking, but maybe not surprising. Um, but how does that bear on the job? Like knowing the, you know, double ledger bookkeeping and whatnot and GAT, you know, generally accepted accounting practices and all that. How does that you know, did you feel like your predecessor, you, you had an advantage over your predecessors and, you know, the staff work and so forth? Um, this is my fourth elected position. So my first one was on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, steep learning mm -hmm. curve. That's uh, a historic uh, chamber because of uh, Diane Feinstein and the legends that have come out of there. Exactly. And then I got to the state assembly where my former boss was in the assembly and leader of the senate so that was a little bit more comfortable hmm. then i got elected to the state board of equalization which was a tax board yeah and I've i was had my i've had my dealings yeah i was very comfortable dealing with the tax issues and the yeah. tax appeals so i was like my own staff and so that was very helpful and then as treasurer being account an accountant understanding the numbers and the budgets and all of my you know, past elected positions, uh, I think this is the best job for me, yeah. uh, where I tell people, hey, you may not want to do something that your parents want you to do, but 20 years later, things have come full circle. Oh, we see it in Ojai all the time, these kids who could not wait to get out of Ojai. So how, what could be more lame than this little town? And then when they have kids... They're like, coming back. Yeah. I know. I have two friends uh, that moved here recently because of the schools. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, and they love it. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to love, that's for sure. So, um, oh, so sorry, going back go to being an accountant. Yeah. So I do think it helps because of my training. Uh, we take in money every day on the banker. So we take in about $3.7 trillion last year. I issue all and the this bonds. This is like the fifth largest economy in the world. Fifth or fourth. We're yeah. kind of teetering. Um, Who's the fourth? Maybe uh, uh, Germany. Germany. So it would be the U.S., China, Japan, and then either California, if we were a, a country. sovereign nation. Exactly. Or Germany. So we're very close somewhere. That's really remarkable. Them. Yeah, it is remarkable. And this is post-COVID. Yeah. So even when we were all locked down, post-COVID, we're kind of moving up the ranks because of our entrepreneurs and yeah well silicon valley came out of the came out of the covid crisis and fine fettle yes they did for two years yeah and now we're facing a deficit largely in part yeah what is that 58 billion uh the governor estimates 38 billion okay the lao estimated 68 billion well that's quite a quite a disparity uh it is and, you know, as an accountant, cash basis, accrual basis, mm -hmm. estimates, right? Payables, receivables, everyone it's estimates so complex. things a little So many different. dials. Right, yeah. right. So I would go with the governor's numbers. Yeah. $38 billion. Okay. That doesn't necessarily seem all that much more manageable to me, but if you're talking about a state budget of three, what, three plus hundred billion dollars? Yes, yeah, you know, a billion here, a billion there, it really starts to add up. Well, thanks to Governor Jerry Brown, we have amassed a rainy day savings account of about $38 billion. Yeah. So the governor's going to use about $18 billion from our rainy so day make funds. Make $20 billion from cuts. Right. And um, internal borrowings, delays, yeah. uh, um, you know, accounting. How's the interest rates on uh, California stat or uh, bank fees? Are they, uh, you know, how, how, because interest rates went up, I imagine debt went up too. Is that part of the problem or is it mostly revenue side? No, it is the revenue side. We are highly dependent on personal income taxes. Yeah. They make up about two thirds of our general fund. So when people are not 
getting stock options, stock bonuses. Yeah. People are not selling their stock or their property, right, with commercial, um, mm. with capital gains. And they're sitting on the pile of cash. Exactly. Everyone's sitting, yeah. waiting. Well, I'm a big believer in uh, John Maynard Keynes, you know, the animal spirits. Are you familiar with the general theory of economics and the, uh, you know, what what he did in World War One, especially was in, intriguing, but the... Um, you know, I forget exactly how he put it, but, you know, people get scared and they stop spending money. Right. They get bored and they start spending money. So are we still in the scared part of the cycle? Uh, I, I think there's a lot of wariness, right? Yeah, during the, the wait and see-ness. Well, during the pandemic, about $5 trillion went toward allowing people not to... They don't have to pay their car debt. They don't have to pay their rent. They do not have to pay their student loans, right? So then people had more money in their pocket. Yeah, cash flow. Yep, and they were home. So what are you going to do? You can't go anywhere. So you just got exactly bye bye and just stay in the state. So our sales taxes were really high. And then the federal government gave us or people another five trillion dollars. Yeah. So that's like ten trillion dollars that went to people sloshing around in their pocket with cash, right? And now that the interest rates have gone up, cash flow is kind of dwindling. A lot of the entitlements have stopped. I think people are going to start thinking about going back to work now and spending less. So that's, I think, where we're at. Interesting. Yeah. So how, how, you know, where is the budget right now? Like, is it still committee markups and so forth, or is it? What is going on? So what's I'm I'm the, trying to get to like what's your role in this process? Oh, okay, uh, well I don't have a role in the budget process. The yeah. Governor, you're puts an administrator. Out his, I, yes, exactly. So I'm the banker. Yeah. So I take in the money, I move the money, I issue bonds, and then I oversee 14 different programs that goes toward affordable housing, schools, hospitals, public transportation, green energy, advanced manufacturing. I have four savings programs. That's directly under my office. And then I do sit on CalPERS, CalSTRS, California Earthquake yeah, Authority, Yeah, these retirement Bank. programs are enormous. Yeah, and so anybody that like needs money or wants money should mm-hmm. call me. So um, well, um, I like yeah, this job well, I've got you here. Well, okay, how about Go Green Financing for this building if you want to save some money yeah. and upgrade, right, the windows I'll, and I'll, you know, uh, all I'll make that. sure my landlord listens to this episode. Exactly, gogreenfinancing.com. Yeah. Well, one, one uh, you know, local, some bearing on a local situation is I'm on the board of the Ojai Valley Land Conservancy, mm-hmm. and we do a lot of major projects. Say, for example, getting rid of a rondo, which is not only a nasty fire hazard, but it just sucks up so much water from the water table, one of the fastest growing plants out there. So we rely on a lot of these, you know, climate bonds and whatnot. We didn't apply for some of them this year because we were certain they were going to get clawed back, which they did. So does that, do we just go back to the end of the line or how does that, like when things get better, do, they, do you reissue those programs? We're going to have to start from scratch again. Uh, no. Um, the governor did sign bills that said the program would go into, um, you know, um, what would start if there was money in the budget. So some money he did put in, like last year, he was going to give us $400 million to build more student and faculty housing yeah. on UC, CSU, community college. That's an so, easy solution for a lot of different problems, just yeah. keeping them as close to campus as possible and affordable and all those issues. Exactly, but he took it back yeah. this year. So we are going to still move forward. Uh, do our due diligence, work with the different uh, schools, and figure out when the program does come back online, who's going to be eligible, right? Who yeah. is shovel ready? Who's you know uh, got their financing package uh, mm-hmm. in line? So Staffed up and- we're still going to keep moving forward, even though we don't have the money right now. Yeah. So we're not going to start from scratch. Okay. That's in my office, at least. All right. That's good to know. So another one of those, um, shoot, I forgot what I was going to ask. The um, 
you know, what is your overall philosophy around budgets? Do you see it more as a revenue or more as a cost cutting or where do you find the balance? Well, I mean, that's a big question, I understand. And every situation is going to be different. But if you were to zoom out 30,000 feet. Yeah, I mean, that's the governor's. Like I said, the governor puts his budget together. He just released it on Jan, January 10th. Then he's going to be updating it for the May revise. Yeah. And then they'll have to sign it in June. And the legislature has an oversight role in that they're going to look at each one and as constituents or stakeholders oh, yeah. come It'll be forward. Then dickering and parlay and, yeah. Exactly. It'll be like a, like a, a bizarre, you know, people... And, and so, so you know, the budget may be a little bit tweaked, yeah. uh, but, you know, the governor doesn't like when the legislature tells them, we completely disagree with this, like transportation last year, mm-hmm. right? They want more money into transportation. They wanted money into, like, certain pots, and he didn't really like that. So, yeah. um, so they can tinker, but not complete overhaul. Yeah. So my role is really when I can sell the bonds, when I can sell the bonds, yeah. how much money is in the budget to sell the bonds. So that's kind of my initial role. Right now I'm waiting mm-hmm. and ready to sell bonds um, for infrastructure uh, to continue these projects because you don't want to have construction crews out there and then the money Not runs out. That happens. It's happened. That did happen, you know, yeah. in the Great Recession, for example, like everything had to stop. So um, I think we're better off and so that's kind of my role and then as the legislature is going through their bills they will ask me in my office Mm -hmm. like if we don't have money how can we finance it can we issue bonds are there any other ways and so that's kind of my role in the budget process with the legislators yeah well you have been in the legislature do those relationships that you developed that like a daily uh benefit absolutely um the fact that i have worked with many of them either as staffers or when they were in a different capacity and now because i understand and really respect the legislature we most have a, of them most of them yes um we have a pretty i have a list of names here i want to run down and give no i'm just teasing yeah so um you know well, what, well so, i do have one though what about our boy steve bennett who's been uh you know around the scene for years he used to teach history at nordoff high school steve bennett steve bennett is great he's been very helpful my husband is also on the port commission in oxnard yeah very important and because of the storm they lost uh, an important piece of equipment and um, steve has been there and he is continuing mm-hmm. to he's a very much about right. constituent service exactly yeah, yeah. So one of the crown jewels of California, I think it's indisputable, is our university system. How is that coming, weathering the storms? How do you feel like the future? You mentioned the faculty housing, student housing, and so forth. But, you know, is this always going to be $11,000 to get a degree for, you know, for a year at uh, UCLA, for example, or UC Irvine? Uh, I, I think the regents are very focused on trying to keep tuition low, yeah. right? But costs continue to go up. The UCs have rich endowments. Thanks they, to the not alumni. Harvard level, not $60 billion, but Not, but I mean, I, I think they could if they yeah. focused a little more, but that's not really their main No, I hope it isn't, tool. because I know the indignity suffered by college administrators, especially when they're behind Princeton's and Harvard's and so forth in that legacy game. And I just feel like it's kind of broken. But California has managed to keep the integrity of the, you know, affordable, respected people from all over the world consider that, you know, a Palm League degree is the equal of an Ivy League degree. So I just really, whatever it takes to keep that foremost as we go through this, I think a lot of people are very much invested in that. And I think community colleges, right, it is free now for any yeah, first-time college. That's really parent. important. So I always tell parents and students, like, if you don't know what you're 
want to do, mm-hmm. why don't you go to a community college, save your parents some money, and if you do well, some of them directly feed into a CSU or a UC. So this is like a little-known secret. Oh, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm well aware of that. That was what I told my kids to do, is to get your go, go to community college for two years, transfer into UCLA or uh, Berkeley or whatever as a, as a freshman or as a uh, junior. And, did it and then you come out with a degree. No, it didn't in this particular case for reasons. It, everything worked out fine, but it didn't quite plan, didn't quite hatch. So I think we have 117 community colleges in mm-hmm. California. They all need housing. Yeah. Right? More and more kids are going to community college, and they are a lot more nimble. So if we are going to go into AI, for example, well, one of the community colleges could hire local instructors and say, hey. That's one of the advantages of community colleges. They're hiring people who are working in the field and who have that skin in the game kind of knowledge about what they're teaching. Exactly. But there's no place for them to live. So we hear about the kids living in their cars, you know, trying Mm. to stay on people's couches. And so if we could build more housing on community college sites, I think that segment would grow. Yeah. And then they can save some money and not go into high student loan debt, which is why I strongly promote Scholarship 529. Scholarship 529. Scholarship 529. Scholarship 529. Which is a college savings plan, which Mm -hmm. I oversee in my office. And I am always promoting saving, saving, saving. It's never too early or too late to save. So Mm -hmm. the more we can save, you can save, send around a you gift link so that people don't buy your kids some toy they're going to throw away and get bored with, but they can put money into the college savings account. So, well, I'm imagining a kid open his uh, Christmas presents on uh, Christmas Day and finding a certificate for a save- savings plan like that. And it seems like it would fall into grandma socks kind of category, though, for a kid that's looking for a, you know, a a Crossman 22, um, you know, air rifle. I, I, I agree. And I've gotten that before. I've gotten a bond, savings bond, for example, right? Yeah. And you're like, what do I do what with that? Dad, mom, do? here, take yeah. it, put it away. Put it away. Yeah. But you did get those bonds paid out, though, eventually, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and at that moment, did you feel the value? Well, my parents started saving for us as soon as we were born. And all three of us did not have any student loan debt. Wow, that is remarkable. We actually had extra money. So my extra money after college, I bought a two-unit building in San Francisco. And so I've been a homeowner building equity. And so that's a big uh, thing that I push is, you know, home ownership, Mm -hmm. right? We have affordable housing. It is not easy in California. It is not easy. Especially not in Ojai. Prices have gone bonkers. So... California last year with our surplus, we put money to help first time home buyers with free down payment assistance up to 20% yeah. of their value of the house. And then the state gets paid after uh, the homeowner sells the property or refinances for the second time. And then that money would go back into the pot so other people can use it. That program was so popular, it opened and closed in two weeks. We're going to open up another round this spring, but Whoa. the new hmm. the new twist is for first time home buyers whose parents don't own a home. Wow, just that the ladder of prosperity. I, I did uh, six years in the Air Force and had a great time. Um, never really thought much about it until I moved to Ohio and trying to buy a home. VA loan is a lifesaver. I would have never been able to get onto that first rung without. You know, the zero, the guaranteed lowest possible interest rate. And, you know, you, you get some flexibility on your credit scores and whatnot. Exactly. So I issue but, the bonds for the CalVet Home Loan Program, and there is money in there. So right, any veterans? Step forward. Exactly. Yeah. I'm glad I did, but I didn't get to go to college out of it as planned because my mother was spending all the money that I was saving as soon as it was going in. Uh, so... Not to feel sorry for myself. It all worked out, obviously. But you have a house. I do. In Ojai. Yeah, which is not nothing. Exactly. So, um, you know, the other issue, and they're all interlinked. You mentioned in college and, you know, 
faculty housing and so forth, just homelessness. It just seems so intractable. It's like all this human tragedies out there multiplied by tens of hundreds of thousands. And I just wonder, I've heard it described, you know, people think that, oh, it's a mental health crisis and so forth. But it isn't, though. I read somewhere that the truly diagnosable bipolar schizophrenic population is like 20% or 25% of homeless. That we think of it as being long term, but it's people who are on the bottom rung who dip in and dip out of homelessness. That's the that's the problem that seems like it can be addressed. I mean, obviously the mental health issues are huge, <clears throat> but it's a much more complicated situation than that. Yes, and I, mean, I think there's addiction issues as well. Yeah. Um, so it is complicated. And I used to work for Senator John Burton and his big know focus area was people who are underserved who don't have a voice and yeah. foster youth single moms homeless individuals so i know a little bit more about uh being homeless so if you get robbed and you lose your driver's license for example how do you get a new driver's license uh well i don't know how do you well you need a passport Mm. or an original birth certificate. Yeah, and none of which are easy to obtain. And if you're already out on the street or facing homelessness, then it makes it so much harder to get any of that. And you can't get anything without ID. Yeah. So navigation It's one of those centers. problems. We don't necessarily think about that, but just having that some kind of uh, you know identification is critical. And if you're going to get services, you need to communicate with someone. Someone needs to call you back. You need to email or text. Well, if you don't have a phone, because you can't pay for your phone bill. And how do you show up clean and and well presented for a job interview? And I mean, it's difficult. So in San Francisco, we have navigation centers, and other cities are creating them. So we basically say, if you want help. Come in, bring all your stuff, you know, your shopping cart, your backpacks, your girlfriend, boyfriend, your pets, Mm -hmm. your habits. Come in, we provide them a place, and then we start with the wraparound services, getting them the ID, right? Getting them the clothing, getting them the medication that they need. But a lot of communities don't want to have homeless people in there. Yeah, it's a focal point for NIMBYism, sure. Exactly, so... I think the navigation centers are great because you can't even tell that they're really here. You take a parking lot or Mm -hmm. under an underpass, and they completely seal it up. So it looks like like a Cirque du Soleil tent. Oh, really? Wow. And when you drive by, you're like, like, I wonder what's in there. You never see anybody loitering. They have security. So those, I think, are the solution for, you know, initially getting people off the street because you have to stabilize them. And then once you stabilize them, they have to go to housing, but not everybody's ready. Well, especially if it's a clean facility where they, you know, because people aren't, addicts aren't going to go into one of those places. They got to get sober first. And I think a lot of people that feel put, that they need to put in those moral restraints don't really understand what's going on there. So it is very complicated. We could talk yeah. about this. <laughs> sure. Well, locally, uh, a friend of the pod, Dan Parzial, started a program, Mesa Farms which is geared towards kids leaving the foster care system who more than half of them end up on the streets because there's no sur- no support. Right. They're just kicked out with a plastic bag full of their clothes. Yeah, so I think community college, you can now directly go into a community college program if you're mm-hmm. a foster youth, so you don't have to go get your... You know, yeah. your grades and fill out your all these forms and stuff. And so that's been helpful. And there's a lot of transitional housing for foster youth where they can stay up to like 25 years old instead of getting yeah, that's what Yeah, that's what Dan's program at Mesa Farms is 25 is the cap. That's great. But then they also need jobs, right? They yeah, have to that's learn they're, and they have to earn doing, money yeah. so that they can afford to pay the Well, also just that. how to take care of themselves and get yeah. to appointments on time and put in an honest day's work and cook for themselves and 
a lot of these things that you don't really think about, but they're important life skills. We just assume that people are either know it or they'll figure it out, but without some guidance, it can be a uh, can be brutal. Mm-hmm. And I've got a new program. They're called Hope Accounts. Hope Accounts. So mm-hmm. for any young person who's been in the foster youth system for 18 months or more, they will be eligible for a certain amount of money in their Cal Kids or Hope account uh, so that they can save up money for college or an apprenticeship program. So those are coming hopefully by this summer. Oh, very nice. So uh, do you get these, uh, do you shepherd these uh, initiatives through the executive branch or the legislative branch? They both. normally, yes, um, you know, the governor has his programs that he will get someone to author or he can put it in the budget, mm-hmm. but it's usually through the legislature where they go through the system yeah. nine months and then they have to get funding and then their markups and whatnot. And then they'll come to the agencies to administer and distribute the funds. Yeah. Interesting. So back to the, you know, longer term problems like the climate crisis um what you know how what's your role in all that because you're the banker a lot of these you know there's a there's an upside to this and i like to talk about that is the transition to the green economy is almost certainly going to create more jobs than than are lost because it's a brand new everybody's starting from roughly the same place so it is not going to have the you know winner take allness of like petroleum industry and so forth. Yes. So what's going on with you in that regard? Yeah, so I administer two programs that give out incentives for clean, green companies to come to California. Uh, One is a sales tax exemption. So if companies are coming and they are going to buy fancy equipment, right, Mm -hmm. for lithium extraction or battery storage, they can apply to get their sales taxes waived. Mm-hmm. And that could be millions of dollars that can go yeah, back for, into operations. So for, it's competitive. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of companies that are coming. Who is the competition anyway? Uh, the competition for what? These for sales tax exemptions? For getting these jobs. For bringing these companies to California. Other I states. I know Texas, obviously. Yes. But they start with a zero income tax. That seems like a pretty. But their property idea. taxes. Even and out. Vary. Yeah. You know, one I know. Year, it seems like they're a little sneakier about it. They're redistributing the wealth in a different different way. Yeah, so every state has to balance their budget, Yeah. right? So how good is that state in managing their expenses, right, their costs? Mm-hmm. So, um, so even though other states have no income tax, well, maybe their sales taxes are higher or their yeah, property, property taxes, taxes you know, yeah. fluctuate, which is something that we don't have here in California, right? So every state is a little bit different. But yes, Texas, uh, Florida. Yeah, of course. I love the, did you see the debate with uh, Gavin Newsom and Ron DeSantis? What's your notes on that? I did not see it, sorry. You didn't see it? No. I I thought, you know, everybody's going to claim their guy won. But I was really surprised at how Newsom handled, you know, the big, big things like, you know, the exodus of, Talent. Well, there's people from Florida moving to California as well. Younger people with entrepreneurial drive. Like Cal- Florida is getting the older people with their stock of wealth, which is good for them. But California is getting the younger, more energetic people who build wealth. Yes. And some of these tech companies, they want to move out of state, but then they can't find the workers or the workers don't want to go with them. That's right. That's a big point. You could just go to Pinedale, Wyoming, and they would welcome you with open arms. But, uh, who, you know, you're looking around, who's, who's, who's coming with us? Uh, no, I think I'll stay here. Exactly. And the other, um, big feather in California's cap, I feel, is like the entertainment industry. Because I've had this discussion before. Everything is downstream from culture. Everything. Politics especially. And it all starts with, not all starts with, but it's all, you know, like, uh, what do you call it? A synecdoche of uh, Hollywood. People take their cues from us. What is, you know, what's your take on that, that 
segment it because it's really not that big as far as like total size but its influence is gigantic yeah so when i was in the legislature in 2006 we saw an exodus of a lot of the movie production companies to other countries and other yeah, states. vancouver especially and georgia Georgia? Oh, yeah, Atlanta, Georgia. There's a lot of productions. There. Oh, yeah. So they rolled out the red carpet, gave the industries anything they wanted, and we had to pass our first film tax credit back in 2007. Mm-hmm. It brought back some of the smaller productions, independence, TV, yeah. and then we have since passed two more film tax credits. The impact of the strike recently, Oof. Screen Actors, You're Writers probably feeling Guild, that. is... Mm-hmm. Part of the reason we have a deficit, right? Yeah. All these wealthy actors, producers, they make a lot of money, and mm. they weren't making money. So yeah. that takes a chunk out of the personal income tax as well. So that contributed, but... But if they're making huge. more money in the future, then that'll circulate back, hopefully. I exactly. guess that's the idea. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I see these as being all interlinked, and in one of the, you know, uh, AI artificial intelligence it's everybody's talking about it and thinking about it i use it in my job occasionally i'm i'm very impressed at how much it's improving and how rapidly what is that what does that mean for you well i like to post on social media every day and you know after a while the posts are the same because you think the same you use the Mm -hmm. same words and now with chat gpt i'll say like make it funnier Make it snappier, make it shorter, make it more intellectual. And I'm like, this is amazing. So I'm so glad I got to get to see this. Yeah. (laughs) Well, they, you can optimize the SEO functions. You can do, you know, give you the best hashtags, everything. It's just, wow. Do you you chat GP4? Are you paying subscription? I'm not. No. No, I just, I wonder if it's, yeah, I wonder if it's worth it. I haven't really. Decided. I've tried Chat DP4, but that was some months ago, and I didn't really notice that big of a difference. It seems like just a very complex, like predictive text algorithm. I don't think it's got into any kind of the critical reasoning. But that was, like I say, months ago. Right. I know people are using it for data. Oh my God! To so, be able to sift through the reams of data like that is brilliant. Exactly. So someone kind of put all of my filings, like my donors, yeah. into it, and it gave a chart of who donates, where they live, you know, who they are, it categorized yeah. it. I mean, How much wealth they have. And this is... Other donations they've given. I mean, I've been on the ballot 20 times, so, you know, you Those have to sift through a you. lot of paperwork, all my filings, to for someone to kind of figure out figure or, or out just been like giving you money or, exactly and you put it into this computer program and it yeah. turns it out for you isn't so. that just i think we need to step back sometimes in awe of what's going on i just remember a louis ck bit he's talking about a guy he was on a flight and a guy was you know the the uh stewardess uh, announced on the intercom uh, sorry sir uh, or sorry people due to some uh, meteorological disturbance or whatever our internet will be down for uh, as much as 15 to 20 minutes and the guy next to him goes like what and then louis thinking wait a minute now they're bouncing signals into outer space and back and you're in a tin tube seven miles in the sky and you're complaining and it's like Everything is amazing, and nobody's happy. And the satellites are in the sky. Yeah. So I always thought when the airlines go, oh, you need to turn off all of your, you know. Electronic your, devices. Your electronic yeah. devices. I never really understood like, that, but I'm happy to take it because I'm a nervous flyer. Yes. I, I, I think the same way, but I'm like, well, but everything's in the sky, you know. And so now I, I guess we can have Wi-Fi yeah. when we're flying. But I that, have no idea why that changed. But Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like the break. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now the, what is it, you know, if you're just taking crystal ball AI, how's that going to transform the state, the economy, the cultural influence, the, your job? How is that, you know, how do you imagine this unfolding over the next few years? I think it could make government and funding more efficient. So yeah. if you could run through... Foster youth, for example, 
we have certain data. We've given money out, right? We know where they live, mm -hmm. potentially, right? They're getting something. Well, if you're able to better analyze, then you can say, oh, most of the foster youth are in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we should build more housing maybe yeah. in San Francisco? Right? Targeting. Targeting. Uh, focusing, right? Medical mm -hmm. costs. Yeah, that's yep. a big one. That's a big one. Yeah. But if someone is doing the data saying that, you know, they're getting stints or they're getting hip replacements, knee replacements, right? Mm -hmm. How old are they? How much is it costing? Where are they? Right? We could put rehab centers where closer yeah. to where the they're people, needed. they're needed. I Less mean, uh, fraud, waste, and abuse. Yes. Yeah. And you may not need so many middlemen. Yeah. What's going to happen to all these middlemen, though? If they're going to be out of work, oh. that's going to be a strain on the system. I know we've gone through these transitions before, and it always comes out as a net net plus value. But in between the transition, I mean, my job is entirely dispensable. I don't imagine that you know. But I'm old. I'm going to be out of the game here before too long. So it's not. Is a, this your job? Every what day? podcasting? Yeah. No, it's part of my job. I'm a publisher. I do print products. So as you can imagine, I'm dealing with a transition. But um, I'm amazed at how well the writing algorithms are just for, you know, you can say write, you know, a 13,500 word novella in the style of Mark Twain with, you know, Kierkegaard's uh, political view or yeah. something. And it's phenomenal. You can write it in the form of, uh, you know, 140 word tweets per chapter, or whatever. It's just the possibilities are just endless. They're so far beyond human capacity already. And so you're adjusting, right? You're pivoting. Well, I'm trying to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons I do the podcast is it's a human to human exchange that can't be replicated yet. Yes. Yeah. That's true. But like you think about like the maps when we used to drive, right? We always had maps. Yeah, God, I love maps. And then we had the Thomas guys, which were like yeah. amazing. Every car back had then. a back seat with a Thomas guy. Yeah. In it. yeah. And now like the kids are like, what? They, they can't read a map. Yeah. Right? So things evolve. Mm -hmm. People evolve. Yeah. I know. We just have to adapt to change. It's just going to be a constant. I guess it's if we stay on top of it or we get run over by it because it's happening. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm a big fan of history. In fact, I love Kevin Starr books. I haven't read any in a while, but the state historian really gives you insight in what a remarkable place this is. People from all over the world who have come here. And what's your um, what you, what's your favorite period of if you were to go back to any period in California history, which one? Like, what, what hinge point would you like to be at? I know it's kind of a big question, but, like, say, Hiram Johnson, Progressive Era, uh, Gold Rush, mining camps in the Sierra Nevada with Bret Hart and Mar Samuel Langhorne Clemens. And uh, I, I am, like, a futurist. <laughs> I am not one that looks back every day. Okay. Fair so enough. I love today, and I love the innovation and where you we're going. You wouldn't want to give that up. So, well, who would yes. you like to meet if you were to say, I'm going to have a dinner party with any historical figure that I want? Can you name a few? <laughs> you always get in trouble when you do that. Well, we're talking about people who have been dead for decades. Dead for decades. Uh, well, we just had... Martin Luther King Day, mm -hmm. and you know all the reflections of this man who wanted change in a peaceful, mm -hmm. nonviolent manner. Satragaha, Satragara, or Satragaha, the peaceful nonviolence. Yeah, and so you think about it and how divisive things are these mm -hmm. days, and how violent they and are. Getting. The They're flashpoints. Getting, and people are talking about, you know, love and compassion and helping each other, thinking about others instead of yourself all the time. So, yeah. you know, I think we need more of those, you know, Martin Luther King folks who 
want to see change, but in a peaceful, nonviolent way. And working within the system, more or less, or bending the system to the demands of justice. Exactly. Yeah. I like the, you know, not liked, I'm just intrigued by the pivots that he was making towards the end of his life. And he knew, I mean, he said many times that he's not going to be around. He's, he's Moses. He's bringing people to the promised land. He's not going to get to see it. But he talked about, um, you know, the um, sanitation worker strike in Memphis. Yep. That was a very integrated union. There were just as many white jan- janitors and sanitation workers as there were black. And he was trying to get more to a class-based protest system, economic equality and justice, not just anti-Vietnam, which was very much a class warfare because those are my people over there fighting. Both of my brothers were in Vietnam. So I thought that was probably very dangerous for him to step out into that because stirring people up and keeping them against each other is a very effective ploy divide and conquer yeah the power system really really uh, grinds people down like that and i found that when you are personally affecting someone's income their salary yeah. their money the stakes go way up yeah and this would have been a way that would have redistributed wealth across social and racial lines you know, these these strikes that he was supporting, not just in Memphis, but Chicago and other places yeah. as well. Yeah. He would have been, I think, 96 this year. Yeah, isn't that something? Elvis would be 95, I guess, 1935. Yeah. So, and there's so wow, many people th- that today, they probably would still be around. Yeah, well, Elvis might still be around. There's occasional sightings. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned the future. What? does that mean to you like where did where are some like maybe pilot programs or ideas burbling up through you know academia or you know the conventions and uh ted talks and whatnot do you anything that really sticks out for you well i think in in academia um going back to the uc system where they have better endowments, and they're able to partner with the private sector mm-hmm. in terms of innovation. Yeah, and well, Stanford's famous licensing programs, you know. Exactly, the Caltechs and stuff. Um, community colleges, like I said, are able to pivot and you know change to accommodate the needs of today. I think it's a CSU system mm-hmm. that needs to innovate a little bit. We need to figure out how to make them more viable if they're cheaper than the UCs, Mm -hmm. right? And they fill that middle ground. They fill that middle ground. What can we do to make sure that they are going to be sustainable, viable, and continue to be affordable for students? So I'm thinking about ways, right? They can't pivot as quickly. They don't have the necessary endowments. They should partner, I think, more. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the uh, Channel Islands... CSU Channel Islands has had some initiatives to reach out to the business community and partnerships. They've had some inspired leadership there. CSU I feel that's been good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. CSU Channel Islands is interesting because they were given that plot of land. Yeah, the state mental hospital. That's my a great idea for a film that I'm pitching is the, you know, uh, horror movie based on, you know, the insane asylum that was there before and with co-eds and the dorms and everything else. I think it's the perfect setup for a slasher film. Okay, I'll leave that to you. Okay. <laughs> but we gave them the land, but we said we're not going to fund you. And so what do they do? They built housing on it. Yeah. And it's for faculty, it's for student, but fair mark, you know, for the community too. People pay mm-hmm. to live there. And mm-hmm. so their budget is probably better than most CSUs, but that's what I'm saying. They've done it through their own initiative. Exactly, without a lot of government help. And so Hmm. we need to kind of think more creatively with each site. Yeah, I remember uh, Herman Hesse's book, uh, The Glass Bead Game, Magister Ludi, and that was all about, you know, the, the town and gown relationships. And this was medieval period and and this kind of weird liminal space between you know the future and the past but integrating 
academia with the communities. That was the challenge of that book. Mm. And it was beautifully done. I can see that being a model. Well, anything else out there that's interesting? Um, I'm a big fan of our fairgrounds. Yeah. They've been around for 150 years. And they're so much fun. They're fun. Uh, they're still the last place that is family friendly and affordable, not only for the relatively. fairs, that's relatively, all relative, but yeah. for the community. But they need a lot of upgrades. Yeah. They need a lot of renovations. They need a lot more flexibility mm-hmm. to be able to generate incomes that they are self sustaining. Yeah, to be ho- to venue hosting. Right. Yeah. Right. And There's so, a lot of a lot of things they can do that they're not. So um, very supportive of that. And then I go around the state and try to figure out which cities and counties are open to what type of industries and investors. Hmm. Lots of investors always come. Is that your go, job at connecting? Um, connector? I, I make it my job because yeah. I know where the money is. I know mm-hmm. who to call if money is stuck. Uh, I'm a good resource. I have good relationships with local elected officials. And so I can be that bridge. And so yeah, I do that a that's lot. That's a vital role. It is. A vital if, role. And if we don't have businesses and high quality jobs here, we're not going to continue to be this golden state. So that's something that I do every day I'm out in the community. I'm going to speak at the Rotary in right, seven minutes. Right, off, yeah. Just to let the community know, hey, these are the resources uh, that are available. If you have projects that need, um, you know, gap financing, you know, all the programs the federal government gave us to help small businesses and nonprofits. So um, I do a lot of that in the community. Well, well done. I think we're going to have to wrap up. I got to get to Rotary, too. Oh, okay. All right, Fiona, thank thank you so much. Thank you, Brett. Hey everyone, Brett Bradigan here, just thinking out loud. Now we talked about a lot of interesting facets of her very demanding job. I learned later that her entire staff is only 500 people, 10 of whom are in Los Angeles. It seemed rather shocking to me, not surprising to me, not shocking, because I figured that much money, 300 billion dollars going through the office would take a lot of uh, green eye shaded accountants but no it's a ministerial position just getting that mo- money moved around and I was glad to hear that I don't like to see huge bureaucracies and it was also very interesting that she was only in our 180 some year history as a state just the second CPA to hold that position, which um, I don't know how I feel about that. Just that it's a political role, and I feel gratified that we've got an actual accomplished professional in that field, in that role. And uh, you may know she's running for lieutenant governor here pretty soon which, um, as a Democrat in California, her chances of getting office are pretty good. And all I'll say is that her predecessor as lieutenant governor, if she succeeds, was Gavin Newsom. So I think you can connect the dots from there. Anyway, that's it for this episode of Ojai Talk of the Town. Thank you all for listening, and uh, I'll keep an ear out for you.